Good evening. My name is Michael Anderson and with Professor Emerita Robin Ewing, I'm co-director of the CREATE Centre. Um, the CREATE Centre, for those who are interested, I'll explain a little bit about. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that I'm on Gadigal land um, of the Eora Nation. I also want to pay my respects uh, to Elders past, present and emerging uh, and recognise that this land was never ceded. Uh, if you would like to acknowledge the land you're in, please feel free to pop it in the chat. That'd be great. Uh, tonight, we are in for a great treat. Um, and we are in the, the process of uh, programming the rest of the years and the rest of the treats um, for uh, 2024. Uh, of course, create one of CREATE's three things is doing public communications and webinars. Uh, and events. We just had a very successful uh, conference, the Leading Creative Schools Conference uh, on Friday and Saturday last week. That's part of our events, as are the webinars, uh, as are the Sydney Ideas um, panels, and that's available on the Sydney Ideas uh, site if you're interested in that, which is called The Art of Good Health. So please have a look at that, and um, I'll try and pop that in the uh, chat, or Anna might be able to pop that in the chat as well. Uh, if you're interested in that. The other things CREATE does is to advocate for the arts creativity uh, in applied settings, so in health, in wellbeing, uh, in schools, in all sorts of places where uh, it makes sense for the arts to be making a difference. Uh, and that's many, many places, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, tonight, it's my very great privilege to uh, introduce Kathana Sel Selvaraj, uh, who's doing a session called Thinking in Colours, Embodying Knowledge. Uh, an intriguing title, I think, uh, which promises some really exciting insights and some uh, exciting thoughts. Uh, Kathana is an art therapist and counsellor in practice at Thinking in Colours. She has a Master of Art Therapy from WSU, Western Sydney University where she developed a deep passion and dedication to areas of research based on the intersections of LGBTQIA plus identity and migrant cultures, and the need for progressive and institutional shifts to better hold and support these marginalized populations. She also has a Bachelor of Fine Art at UNSW Art and Design, where she learned to cultivate a critical social justice lens to navigate systems of oppression and otherness while using art both as a methodology and a tool for healing and resistance. And I believe she's also doing a master's at the University of Sydney. So Kathana is obviously incredibly busy, but you can see how her work really aligns to the kinds of work that we're thinking about at the CREATE Centre. So welcome Kathana, thanks for joining us. Really looking forward to hearing some of what you have to say. Thank you so much, Michael. It's a great privilege to be here tonight with the CREATE Centre as part of the University of Sydney. Um, yeah, tonight we'll be discussing embodied knowledge and art making using a decolonial praxis. And while the content is dense in some cases, hopefully there's some moments there that um, we can reflect and embrace as um, embodied knowledge systems outside of Eurocentric knowledge systems as well. So I might just share my screen. So again, good evening, everyone. My name is Kathana Salvraj. I'm delighted to welcome you all here tonight. I understand that many of you have likely had a full day already, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Tonight, I invite you to see this gathering as a chance for growth and reflection. Think of it as a planting a new seed or nurturing the one already within you. And I really hope that with tonight, you may find moments to connect with yourself and honour whatever thoughts and feelings might arise. So I would like to pay my respects also to the first people of the lands on which I am hosting this webinar, the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past and present and any First Nations people in the audience today or viewing as, as we're going to be recording this too. I acknowledge you as the very first storytellers 
art makers, creators of technology and embodied knowledge. I honour your continuous connection to culture, waters and communities. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And it's so great to see some of you already entering into the chat, the country you're on, and please include your pronouns and name if that's something you feel comfortable with as well. I would love to see where everybody is tuning in from. Okay, so a little bit about myself. My Again, my name is Kapana Selvaraj. My pronouns are she, her. I am a contemporary artist, emerging academic, and an art therapist. In my capacity as a clinician, um, I've worked with various services and organisations, including the NOS Council, Department of Education, STARTS, which is the services for the treatment and rehabilitation of torture and trauma survivors, as well as the Bobby Goldsmith Foundation and Headspace among some of them. My experience here involves working with young people, LGBTQIA plus people, those in the resettlement process as refugees, people living with HIV, as well as working with alternative family systems. I have also worked with the Art Therapy New South Wales, both as an artist and producer. One of my recent programs there involved a series of conversations with contemporary artists discussing contemporary art and the South Asian diaspora. I also created a series of inclusive programs which use art therapeutically and support those of diverse abilities and cultural locations. Something I created was a multi-sensory experience where we acknowledge how our senses are deeply connected to memory, storytelling and cultural wisdom. So my approach to decolonial praxis in art therapy and art materiality is very much rooted in the recognition of embodied knowledge and vernacular wisdom as essential components of therapeutic practice and legitimate ways of knowing. I will be exploring these bodies of knowledge and terms in more detail tonight. But ultimately, I'm interested in alternative ways of knowing through the process of art making calling on my ancestors within the Hindu philosophies and the Ayurvedic philosophies as they intersect with the scholarly work of contemporary research. So before we delve into the presentation tonight, I think it's important to engage in some self-reflexivity. So acknowledging our positions within systems of power and knowledge is essential for meaningful dialogue. As a non-First Nations person, I recognise that I am a settler on stolen land. And I want to also acknowledge and honour the intersections of my South Asian heritage and queer identity navigating oppressive systems, including the colonisation of my Indian ancestral roots. What is important to note, as it will be discussed tonight, is in the context of colonisation, terms such as Indigenous knowledge can be used as the knowledge systems, practices and beliefs that existed prior to and during colonisation. However, I recognise that while my Indian culture has rich history and encompasses diverse traditions, it should not be considered Indigenous knowledge in the same sense as the knowledge systems of Indigenous people in the Americas, Australia, Africa or other regions. So I'm not without recognition of how, again, some of us have likely already been through some different exhausting things today. And so I would like to invite you all just to take a deep breath in, if that feels okay. I like to do this before I start scary things, new things, teacher class, feeling overwhelmed, whatever it is. And so you're welcome to join me. Feel free to close your eyes if that's something you'd like to do and just a deep breath in with me and hold and out. One more breath in and hold and out. And when you're ready, just gently open your eyes if they're closed and settle into the space. A gentle reminder that there is no wrong or right way to be tonight. So I just invite you to show up as you are and hopefully you have a cup of tea or something delicious 
Um, so let's begin. I really wanted to draw upon a profound insight from Bell Hooks to open up the presentation today. And her words often serve as a guiding light in my exploration of complex social dynamics. She stated, sometimes people try to destroy you precisely because they recognize your power, not because they don't see it, but because they see it and they don't want it to exist. In this really poignant reflection, Hooks highlights a fundamental truth about power. It can be both a source of liberation and a target for oppression. The recognition and acknowledgement of one's power can promote, provoke fear and resistance from those who seek to maintain systems of domination and control. So this notion of power really intersects deeply with our conversation tonight as we delve into these intricate webs of knowledge production. So breaking it down a little bit more, our intentions for tonight, we'll explore how art making can serve as a decolonial framework for knowledge production, centering embodied knowledge and challenging oppressive systems through art materiality. We'll discuss the historical context of art as a tool for self-realization, healing and connection across cultures, and also how artists have approached this. We will also explore towards the end trauma-informed approaches to using art therapeutically that prioritize safety and cultural sensitivity. So by critically engaging with intersections of power, knowledge and colonialism, as well as trauma-informed practices tonight, the goal really is to work towards a more just and equitable world, right? Where all voices are valued and empowered. So at the very heart, the nexus, the core, the center, the hot fiery center of this presentation is decolonial practice. But before we can begin approaching this, it's important that we discuss how knowledge has been produced and contextualized within the colonial project. And to approach this, I really invite you to think about a world where knowledge isn't just a pursuit of truth, but a battleground of power. We will begin tonight by delving into the intricate relationship between knowledge production and colonization, unveiling the often overlooked dynamics that shape our understanding of the world. Okay. So colonization isn't only about territorial conquest, although it certainly is also about that. It's about the colonization of minds, cultures, and knowledge systems. So let's explore here how colonial powers have historically dictated which forms of knowledge are valued and which are marginalized or dismissed entirely. And this examination will really shed light on the epistemic injustices that persist today and the importance of challenging them. So for centuries, Western knowledge has been upheld as the pinnacle of intellectual achievement, often at the expense of Indigenous, non-Western and marginalised knowledge systems. And the dominance of Western epistemology has led to the marginalisation of alternative ways of knowing and being perpetuating a hierarchical structure where certain voices are privileged over others. This hegemony, extends beyond academia to influence policy making, media representation and societal norms. And colonization isn't just physical, right? It's epistemic. It involves the imposition of one's culture's worldview onto another, erasing indigenous knowledge and histories in the process. Epistemic violence, for example, occurs when colonizers discredit or dismiss the knowledge systems of colonized peoples, labeling them as primitive or backward. And this violence manifests in various forms, from the suppression of First Nations languages to the distortion of historical narratives. 
Indigenous knowledge is so deeply rooted in oral traditions, communal practices and spiritual beliefs and has often been sidelined in favour of Western scientific paradigms. And this devaluation not only undermines the richness of Indigenous cultures, but also hampers efforts for sustainable development and environmental stewardship. As Indigenous peoples, deep ecological knowledge is overlooked. Moreover, it perpetuates stereotypes of Indigenous people as backward or uncivilised, and these harmful, harmful stereotypes reinforce colonial hierarchies. Despite centuries of oppression, Indigenous peoples and marginalised communities have been resilient in preserving their knowledge systems and challenging colonial narratives. Initiatives such as decolonizing education, amplifying Indigenous voices and promoting intercultural dialogue are crucial steps towards dismantling the hegemony of Western knowledge and fostering a more inclusive epistemic landscape. By acknowledging the diversity and the diverse ways of knowing and centering marginalized experiences, we can really strive towards epistemic justice. So as we reflect here on the intricate interplay between knowledge production and colonization, let us recognize the urgency then of reevaluating our epistemological frameworks when knowledge is no longer a tool for domination, but a beacon for empowerment. And in this pursuit, we must confront the legacies of colonialism, however difficult or uncomfortable, and actively work towards building a more equitable and inclusive future for generations to come. So what exactly is the power of art here? And we can look to this in terms of healing and self-realization, as well as tracing the historical roots of healing through creativity. So art has really served as a profound tool for healing across diverse cultures and traditions throughout history, from Indigenous ceremonies to cultural festivals and beyond. The transformative power of art as medicine is woven into the fabric of human experience. In First Nations communities, such as that of Australia and North America and the Māori culture in New Zealand, art is deeply intertwined with holistic approaches to health and wellness. Through storytelling, dance and visual arts, these communities have preserved and also revitalized traditional healing practices, fostering resilience amidst historical and also contemporary challenges. So across the globe, we witness this remarkable revival or this type of cultural renaissance in terms of cultural expression and healing amidst adversity, from African diasporic art movements to Pacific Islander cultural festivals and Latin American indigenous crafts such as Maya in Guatemala, communities are really reclaiming their cultural identities and asserting their sovereignty through artistic expression. And this revitalization extends beyond art itself to encompass broader cultural renewal efforts from the revitalization of indigenous languages to community led education and healing initiatives. Communities are reclaiming their ancestral knowledges and practices. And this is so, so important because it's ensuring the continuity of cultural traditions for future generations. And so in embracing the diversity of healing traditions worldwide, we really glean invaluable insights into the universal language of art as medicine. And these narratives of resilience, cultural revival and collective healing inspire things like empathy, solidarity and well-being across communities. Ultimately, what we see here is art has the potential to transcend cultural boundaries, offering a collective language for healing, resilience and renewal. 
So while we are exploring here the universality of art as a conduit for healing and understanding, we must also navigate the complexities of cultural sensitivity and acknowledge the nuanced ways in which art can be experienced, all within a decolonial framework that values diverse perspectives. So consider the example of First Nations storytelling traditions deeply rooted in cultural heritage and passed down through generations. While these narratives may hold universal themes of resilience and human experience, their interpretations are deeply influenced by their specific cultural context in which they originate. A story that resonates deeply with one First Nations community may not necessarily hold the same significance for another. So again, we've got to recognize that communities of First Nations people are not a monolith. They're just as diverse as various other communities. And this really illustrates the importance of honoring diverse cultural perspectives. Similarly, art forms such as dance and music carry rich cultural meanings and symbolism, reflecting the unique histories and identities of different communities. For instance, in the African diasporic communities, the, rhythm, the rhythmic beat of drumming holds profound cultural significance. And drumming traditions like the Afro-Cuban rumba ceremonies serve as vibrant expressions of cultural identity as resistance. And these rhythmic beats not only connect individuals to their ancestral roots, but they also foster a sense of solidarity and again, collective strength. So in navigating the transformative power of art, we also must acknowledge the role in decolonial praxis, challenging dominant narratives and amplifying marginalized voices. By centering indigenous and marginalized perspectives in artistic discourse, we create space for alternative ways of knowing and alternative ways of being, fostering a more inclusive and equitable space. As scholars and practitioners, as well as students in this audience tonight, our approach to the study and promotion of cultural universality in art must also be rooted in cultural humility and a commitment to decolonization. And this is so important because by critically engaging with diverse cultural experiences and interpretations, we can create environments that honor the richness and complexity of human expression and not harm them. So sip of water, everyone, need it. So colonization. Um, and the imperial project, imperialist project has had huge impacts on mental health and well-being. And this has led to so many things, devastating things like loss of cultural identity, trauma and intergenerational trauma, social and economic disparities, stigmatization and discrimination, cultural loss and the grief of that, healthcare disparities, and continued systemic oppression. So what does a decolonial praxis mean in this context? So I've sort of broken it down into a few elements here, and I know there's a, there's a lot of text there, so please bear with me. But decolonial praxis, particularly in the content, context of embodied knowledge, which is what we're really focusing on tonight, involves a deliberate commitment to challenge and dismantle colonial legacies that have marginalized and oppressed certain ways of knowing. In the realm of art making, decolonial praxis involves recognizing, valuing, and centering alternative forms of knowledge, particularly those rooted in indigenous, non-Western or marginalized cultural tradition. So it isn't just about theory, right? It's about action. And there's a lot of theory happening tonight, but I really want to draw our attention to this idea of action. It involves engaging in acts of cultural resistance and affirmation. So what does this look like for you? If you could think about what does an action mean in this space, I really invite you to think about that. It's about dismantling entrenched frameworks and reclaiming cultural practices against colonial erasure. It is also about embracing collaborative and community-centered 
approaches where we work together to create a more inclusive and equitable society. One really powerful aspect of decolonial praxis is storytelling and oral traditions. And these methods transmit knowledge and cultural memory across generations, conveying complex historical narratives and social critiques. Through storytelling, diverse cultures reclaim agency and cultural so sovereignty, fostering social change and challenging oppressive structures. So ultimately, decolonial praxis is about empowering individuals, right, and communities as well to reclaim their agency and assert their cultural, cultural sovereignty. So as we think about the essence of um, decolonial praxis, let's take a moment to delve deeper into a body of knowledge that was mentioned earlier called vernacular wisdom. And this is something that's really woven into the fabric of diverse cultures. And it's sort of like a treasury of ancestral knowledge and lived experiences. And this wisdom is often passed down through generations. So how does embracing vernacular wisdom intersect with principles um, of de decolonial praxis? So vernacular wisdom refers to the knowledge, beliefs, practices and cultural traditions that are embedded within a particular community or culture. And it's important to note here that vernacular wisdom is more than knowledge. It is the practical insights and profound truths passed down through generations within a community. It's preserved through, again, oral tradition, storytelling, rituals, and everyday practices serving as the heartbeat of cultural heritage. And there are so many examples across many cultures of this, from traditional ecological knowledge, guiding sustainable practices to healing rituals intertwining herbal medicine with spirituality. We can also see it in storytelling traditions conveying moral lessons to agricultural techniques perfected over centuries. So each culture boasts its own unique tapestry of wisdom. And in the wake of decolonization and cultural revitalization movements, vernacular wisdom takes on a renewed significance. It becomes a powerful tool for claiming and celebrating the rich heritage of indigenous and diverse cultures, a means of empowerment. So the understanding of vernacular wisdom intersects closely with the concept of embodied knowledge in decolonial concepts context and I've just sort of broken it down here so you can kind of visually see how they connect I and mean, this is sort of my approach but definitely please feel free to have your own approach to this but vernacular wisdom again isn't just about abstract ideas it is deeply rooted, rooted in the everyday and the everyday lives of communities and let's think about it this way, the knowledge passed down through stories in your family, rituals and traditions isn't something you'll find in textbooks. It's lived experience. And something that is really important here is that within decolonial frameworks, recognizing the value of this local knowledge challenges the dominance of Western ways of thinking. So making space for indigenous and marginalized perspectives to really shine. Vernacular wisdom is definitely, we can see a powerful tool of resistance as well against colonialism. By holding onto traditional practices and cultural rituals, communities assert their identity and resilience in the face of colonial attempts to erase their way of life. It's a form of defiance, a way of saying we're still here and our culture matters. Embodied knowledge like vernacular wisdom isn't just passed down through words. It's woven into the fabric of daily life, whether it's through ceremonies or hands-on learning. It's a holistic approach that recognizes the interconnectedness of different forms of knowledge. And in the decolonial context, this transmission process is key to keeping cultural traditions alive. 
Engaging with vernacular wisdom isn't also just about preserving the past. It's about healing the wounds of colonialism. By reconnecting with their roots, communities reclaim their agency and forge a path towards healing. It's a deeply personal journey, one that involves rediscovering lost practices, reviving ancestral languages, and rekindling relationships with the land. Both vernacular wisdom and embodied knowledge put communities at the very center of knowledge production. Instead of relying on top-down approaches, they prioritize collaboration and inclusivity. So really giving a platform to diverse perspectives within communities. So this is clearly a quite a radical departure from colonial ways of thinking, but it is something that has always existed. So to sum up vernacular uh, wisdom, it is the intertwining, right? So the intertwining of vernacular wisdom and embodied knowledge offers a powerful lens through which to understand the impacts of colonialism and the resilience of those who have endured it. And I thought it might be important just to list some examples here of diverse cultures that celebrate this. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but it's interesting to see how some or most of them actually intersect in their approach. So we have indigenous cultures of the Americas, so the Navajo Nation. There's a rich tradition of oral storytelling, teachings on human nature, spiritual relationships. In African cultures, the sand bushmen of Southern Africa, there is extensive knowledge of the natural environment, experiential learning, fostering deep connections to land. We can also look to the Mediterranean culture, so Greek mythology and philosophy, wisdom embodied in myths, philosophical dialogues, theatre, symposiums for communal engagement, and Middle Eastern and Islamic cultures, Sufi mysticism, music, poetry, embody spiritual wisdom, Rumi, Hafiz, express divine love through poetry. And then there's indigenous cultures of Asia. So tribal cultures in India, like the Gandhi people and the Munda people offer folk dances, crafts, agriculture, and embody community wisdom. So a really deep reverence and connection to the land and cultural traditions. And then finally, indigenous oceanic cultures. So song lines, dream time story, bushcraft skills, deep connection to land, spiritual understanding, and the Māori of New Zealand emphasis on waka papa, so genealogy, history, and interconnectedness. And this is sometimes expressed through things like the haka, marae, as cultural spaces. So I just thought it's really interesting to see how, while their location geographically is quite far, a lot of these practices carry a similar reverence for the land, experiential learning, storytelling, and song lines. So this is something that I think is so, so important to include tonight, is how have artists embraced this approach? Um, because artists really serve as cultural and, and political practitioners. Culturally, artists play a vital role in preserving celebrating and reinterpreting cultural tradition and in some cases actively engaging in political discourse through their work. They have a unique ability to communicate very complex ideas and challenge dominant narratives, provoking critical reflection and sometimes even shaping collective consciousness. So numerous artists employ embodied knowledge and vernacular wisdom, as we've discussed tonight, as decolonial praxis in their work. And these artists, among many others, embody the concept that knowledge production comes from the body, whereby the body and art making act as forms of knowledge production. And so it's really about then advocating for alternative ways of being and know knowing. And this, again, really challenges Eurocentric intellectualization that emphasize the embodied nature of artistic practice as a form of decolonial knowledge formation. So for tonight, we'll look to Shirin Nishat. 
I studied Shirin Nishat when I was a little baby undergrad at UNSW and was so profoundly moved by her work. Shirin Nishat was born in 1957. She is an Iranian-born artist and filmmaker in New York. Nishat's work often incorporates the body as a site of cultural and political expression, particularly focusing on the experiences of Iranian women. Through her use of performance, gesture and symbolism, she embodies the lived experiences and emotions of her subjects, challenging Western stereotypes and Orientalist narratives about the Middle East. She has stated, and I quote, everything I've done is a celebration of the power of women. The Western world sometimes views Iranian women as victims. And while they have indeed been continuously oppressed by religion and difficult political situations, they've always fought back. They have always broken the rules. By centering the body in her visual storytelling, Nishat disrupts Eurocentric notions of knowledge production that prioritize rationality and abstraction over embodied experiences and emotions. She demonstrates that knowledge can emerge from lived experiences, personal narratives and embodied expressions. Nishat's use of the body as a medium for cultural critique and political resistance aligns with the decolonial practices of knowledge formation. As she challenges dominant narratives and power structures through embodied storytelling and visual representation. So the work you were seeing right now is part of her more recent film work, Roja or Roja. And it was created and produced, I think 2016. And the body here is really engaging in the act of its own storytelling. And so you can access this, I think, on YouTube, Vimeo, sort of Google it, um, and you should be able to find a lot of her works. This is some um, one of my favourite works. There's also a work called Turbulence, which, I mean, moved me, to say the least. And so I really invite you to think of maybe looking up that work, Turbulence. It was produced in 1999. So Shirin Nishat's work is also about reaching into the imagination as a way to survive. And art here becomes a place where her most inner and outer worlds connect and even sometimes collide. She has said that art making is the only place where she can be her most truthful. Her work is also beyond herself and reflects her community's anxieties, hopes, and dreams, as well as her own. Where contradictions of fragility and strength of being a woman in Iran are pulled into the center. Nishad's artistic process involves embodied experience of researching, collaborating, and performing. She immerses herself in the cultural context of the subjects engaging in dialogues and collaborations with Iranian women. Through these embodied interactions, she gains insights into their lived experiences, emotions and perspectives, which inform her artistic representations. Her use of the body in her art allows for the expression of complex emotions and political critiques. Through gestures, facial expressions and bodily movements, she communicates themes of resistance, agency, and defiance, as well as feelings of displacement. By embodying these narratives through visual storytelling, Nishat creates a visceral experience for viewers, evoking empathy and understanding beyond Eurocentric abstracted intellectualization. And so I'm going to invite us to just observe this clip together in silence and it contains a few of her film and photography work. And I just ask that as you engage with it, for you to consider the profound impact of storytelling here on your understanding, reflect on the ways in which Nishat utilizes the human body as a narrative tool. So I'm just gonna mute myself and we'll watch it till the end of the clip together.
So I'm just inviting you to settle back into the space together and ground yourself as, as you need. So as you engaged with that video clip of Shirin Ashat's works, I, I really invite you to consider the profound impact again of storytelling on our understanding. Reflect on the ways in which Nishat uses the human body as a narrative tool. What insights are you gaining from this nonverbal communication? And these are questions you, you can sit with. You don't have to answer these um, now. But the intention behind showing this work to you tonight is to invite you to start thinking about how Nishat's approach to embodying stories might enhance your comprehension and connection, not only to the artworks, but also to the subjects within them. And to think about how this could potentially connect with your own respective fields of practice. So moving back into our exploration tonight, we've delved into the profound transformative potential of art making, but as we journey deeper, we encounter vital questions, right? How can we seamlessly weave embodied knowledge into the fabric of our work, especially within the realm of art therapy? What actionable strategies can ensure this integration remains culturally sensitive? And as we ponder these, what broader implications unfold for critical pedagogy, research methodologies, and practical applications within our fields? While we may not be able to answer all of these questions tonight, it's crucial to ignite this conversation. So let's consider how do we not only harness the power of art, but also ensure our approach is inclusive and culturally attuned. And this necessitates laying a foundation of safety and nurturing in our practice, particularly when working with diverse groups. And this begins with embracing a trauma-informed approach, which is a cornerstone for fostering an environment where all individuals can thrive. So navigating the delicate balance here of fostering healing while honoring the rich cultural identities and experiences within each community is a really, really important aspect of this approach. So before we dive into the nuances of working with diverse art materials, let's ground ourselves in the principles of trauma-informed practice. So this approach emphasizes safety. So while safety cannot always be guaranteed, it's about striving for safety, to be as safe as possible. It's about empowerment and sensitivity, acknowledging the potential impact of trauma on individuals engaging in artistic practices. It's not about knowing the certain a person's lived experience from the very beginning. Creating a trauma-informed practice actually just means prioritizing well-being and respecting the diverse needs of participants. One of the pillars of working with diverse communities is cultural sensitivity and respect, as we know. And each community brings its own unique set of practices, beliefs, and values to this space. It's really essential then to honor these cultural nuances. Sometimes you might see practitioners and clinicians incorporating culturally relevant themes, symbols, and materials into their art making initiatives. And it's important here to be careful not to appropriate cultural items and customs. And this involves thorough research into the cultural significance of the elements being utilized and consulting with members of the respective community or cultural experts for guidance. Seeking permission and fostering collaboration with individuals belonging to the culture being represented really ensures that their perspectives are central to the creative process. So care must really be taken here to avoid perpetuating stereotypes or misrepresentation and instead strive for authenticity and accuracy. So proper credit and acknowledgement of the cultural origins of the elements used should be given, along with the expressions of gratitude for their cultural richness. So cultural exchange should be approached as an opportunity for mutual learning and understanding, 
promoting respect, empathy, and appreciation for diversity. Sensitivity to power dynamics here is really crucial, ensuring that artistic endeavors empower and uplift marginalized voices rather than perpetuating existing inequities. Effective communication then becomes important for bridging the gap between facilitators and participants from diverse linguistic backgrounds. So practically providing materials and instructions in multiple languages really ensures that language barriers do not hinder participants' engagement. Additionally, employing interpreters or bilingual facilitators facilitates clear and meaningful communication. And this really fosters a sense of inclusion and understanding. So true inclusivity requires genuine collaboration and co-creation with community members by involving them in the planning and implementation of art making initiatives. We can empower them to shape their own creative experience. And this collaborative approach fosters a sense of ownership and investment in the artistic process, resulting in more meaningful and impactful outcomes. So diversity within communities extends beyond cultural difference to encompass intersecting identities. And this is really, really important, intersectionality, right? So things, intersecting identities such as race, gender, sexuality, ability, age, recognizing and addressing these intersections is crucial for creating affirming spaces for healing tailoring workshops and support groups to the unique needs, say, of LGBTQIA plus and or differently abled individuals demonstrates a commitment to intersectional healing practices. And so this is really important because we can never assume how someone might identify or locate themselves or what their bodily history is or experience with their cultural ancestry. But keeping diverse communities at the center of planning and decision making is so, so important. And finally, in terms of trauma informed practice, advocacy and support comes in too. So advocating for trauma informed policies and practices is really essential for creating safe as possible and empowering environments for all participants. And this advocacy may involve increasing access to mental health resources, providing trauma-informed training for facilities, facilitators, and advocating for policies that prioritize the well-being of marginalized communities without the labor of excavation and pressures to be didactic in their art making. And in this way, it's about advocating for systemic change to create more equitable and inclusive spaces for healing and growth. So we now come to ethical material use, and we, we need to recognize that our responsibility here moves beyond psychological safety. So it also encompasses the ethical sourcing and utilization of materials in our practice. So can, the important thing to think about is the consideration of materials potential to trigger or trauma, re-traumatize individuals. Practitioners should reflect on material choices to challenge oppressive systems and norms as well. And the ethical use of materials demands a conscientious approach to collect selection and handling, considering their potential to, again, either trigger or re-traumatize individuals. While sharp objects or graphic imagery may appear as likely triggers for those with trauma histories, we must also acknowledge the subtler impacts of seemingly innocuous materials. It's essential to avoid making assumptions, recognizing that there's no fixed understanding of how art materials universally connect to harm. So reflecting on my experience as both an art therapy clinician, therapist clinician, and a research student in this field, I really come to understand the significance of factors like symbolic meaning, sensory properties, and potential triggers when selecting materials. Providing alternatives is really important here and accommodations for individuals with specific sensitivities or triggers, again, fosters accessibility within artistic practices. And furthermore, practitioners must remain mindful of the cultural and historical connotations of materials. 
So understanding their potential to perpetuate harmful narratives or stereotypes. And it's important to engage here in critical reflection and dialogue because it allows us to challenge, again, oppressive norms and promote social justice, even through the very act of our material choices. So consider, for instance, the use of found materials. A lot of artists use found materials in their practice, and that is at the center of their art making. Particularly within the context, context of Australia, Aboriginal culture deeply reveres the land. So viewing it as a living entity intertwined with spirituality. So taking natural materials from their place on country for artistic purpose, purposes can sometimes disrupt this delicate balance, potentially seen as disrespectful or harmful. The significance of certain natural materials varies amongst First Nations communities, with some holding sacred or ceremonial importance, integral to traditional healing practices or even storytelling rituals. Beyond the cultural um, considerations, the act of removing natural materials from the land can also have ecological consequences, threatening biodiversity and disrupting local ecosystems. Aboriginal cultural protocols emphasize respectful engagement with the land, highlighting reciprocity, stewardship, and connection to country. So seeking permission from traditional owners or elders and adhering to cultural protocols regarding material use are essential steps in ensuring ethical and culturally appropriate practices. And while using found materials for art can be acceptable under certain circumstances, it's really crucial for those who are settlers and non-Indigenous individuals to approach this practice, particularly within Australia, with humility, respect, and a willingness to learn from First Nations perspectives. So collaborative partnerships can become really meaningful here and engagement with Aboriginal communities to ensure ethical and culturally sensitive material use in art making processes. And finally, as we sort of come towards, taper towards the end, um, and as we navigate the intricate landscape of art materials and its use therapeutically, it's really crucial to delve into specific practices like the use of mandalas. So interesting, I'm, interestingly, I'm currently working on um, as part of writing a chapter in a book on this particular area. I'm South Asian and mandalas are secrets, sacred symbols deeply rooted in Hinduism and Buddhism, and they hold profound spiritual significance. However, during my training in art therapy and also seeing the practice of art therapy within Western art therapy practices, they often, mandalas often undergo this kind of transformation or co-opting serving purposes of relaxation and self-reflection, divorced from their cultural and religious context. And so this appropriation of mandalas underscores again the complexities of cultural dynamics and the pressing need for contextual understanding. It reflects broader trends of Western societies selectively adopting elements of Eastern philosophies without due respect for their origins or the communities they represent. So for art therapists and students tonight, I know this is probably something that you see a lot in your training and in your practice. It's really important to approach this with sensitivity, right? The use of mandalas. And examples of this are mindfulness practitioners. For example, they advocate for the use of mandalas as relaxation tools. And they may indeed argue that everyone deserves to experience relaxation and inner peace. Absolutely, of course they do. But what's important here is we have to really think about the reduction of harm especially when it comes to ancient philosophies. And this is a type of technology. So mandalas is a type of technology and connection to the universe. So regardless of cultural or religious affiliation, from this viewpoint, the focus moves outside of cultural or spiritual origins and moves towards just purely therapeutic benefits. And while it's true that sharing practices across cultures can promote understanding and inclusivity, it's also essential to do so 
respectfully and with awareness of power dynamics and historical context. And the concern arises when practitioners are appropriated without proper acknowledgement or understanding of their cultural significance. In the case of mandalas, practitioners can certainly share these relaxation techniques, but should also educate themselves and their clients about the cultural and spiritual origins of mandalas. Because this really ensures that if you are working with South Asian people or Southeast Asian people, that you have a deep respect and acknowledgement in terms of engaging with mandala use. And you're not just assuming that it's something for you to teach them. So when teaching about this in art therapy or mindfulness practices, inviting someone from a cultural background that, the pra that practices mandala creation can really provide invaluable insight and deepen understanding here. So we're not saying omit the use of mandalas, but really think about broadening the way in which you teach it. Having a guest speaker who can deepen understanding um, and give firsthand experiences, show the cultural significance and traditional techniques, adds depth and authenticity to the learning process. So this approach really enriches the educational experience, right? But it also fosters cultural humility, which we talked about before, and respect amongst students and practitioners. So ultimately, looking back into a trauma-informed approach to art materials necessitates an understanding of trauma's impact, the creation of safe spaces and ethical considerations in material selection and handling. So by prioritizing the well-being and agency of participants, practitioners can leverage art's transformative potential to promote healing, empowerment and social change. So I just wanted to finish off tonight with um, another piece of sage wisdom by my favorite, Bell Hooks, and hopefully it will be something we can take with you. For me, this really gets to the heart of decolonial praxis and embodied knowledge. So she says, understanding how to be true to oneself, how to be one's own is central to decolonization. So as we can conclude our time together, I want to express my sincere appreciation to each of you for joining us tonight. Your attentive presence throughout the presentation has been invaluable. And I'm so grateful to share this opportunity um, to share my insights with you. And if you are someone who is interested in the intersection of art, culture and healing, I really hope you choose to carry some of these reflections forward with you from tonight. Thank you again, everyone. Well, thank you so much. That was really quite profound. Thank you. Thanks so much. So much to reflect on. Um, and I'm sure, well, I, I'm expecting that, um, I'm expecting that other people like me will need some time to think about lots of those things that you raised for us tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sarah, you have an observation. Would you like to make that? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, thank you so, so much. It was really, I'm kind of processing everything as well. Um, but yeah, no, I just want to, I just had, um, mentioned that um, the kintsugi practice from um, Japanese culture has kind of gone the same way as mm -hmm. um, the mandalas have. I know that's been a conversation that a lot of Japanese American art therapists have been having over here in North America um, recently. I've been seeing that pop up more and more on comment threads of just, hey, mm -hmm. this goes completely against what this practice actually is and just being more mindful about like, okay, hey, here's when to use it, here's how, like, yes, the metaphor is incredible and very, um, like, rooted within, like, therapy, like, practices, and at the same time, hey, this is not the way to be using it, so just, I was really, really happy to hear that that was a, par a big part of your presentation, and that was a conversation that was started here as well. Yeah, thank you so much. It's Sarah, is it? Yes, hi. 
Hi, thank you so much for sharing that. I think what you brought up is so, so important because it's this idea of mitigating harm, right? So say if we are utilizing what is seemingly a therapeutic process, a therapeutic practice, is it truly acknowledging the contextual history, the, the body politics, you know, who actually benefits from this? And if we're working with diverse cultures, are we truly considering them in this practice? And so, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So much is probably unintentional, I guess, <clears throat> too. You know, it, it is about becoming um, more knowledgeable and mindful, I guess, of, of um, different cultural understandings. Yeah, absolutely. And it's definitely not always about intention, isn't it? Because we're learning, we're growing, we're finding our crunchy edges. And sometimes that means um, confronting things that we've normalized as, oh, this is fine, but sort of reflecting on it and looking at it and going, well, is it mm -hmm. more than just people in my circle? Is it fine? I think that's why it's so important to take your time as well. Um, because I know there was a lot that was in this, um, but take your time with this journey of reflecting. And again, it's either planting a seed or watering the seed you have in you, <laughs> um, but pace it in a way that makes the most sense to you. Does anyone else have a comment or a question? We're nearly, we're running out of time, but I'd like to make a comment. Right. I know we're nearly out of time, but I'd love to squeeze one in. Thank you so much. It's just so much I'm going to look back over with the video and just like sit with the slides and sit with the video and all that. Um, do you have anything to guide us with the idea of working with mixed groups in that you may well in any room where you're working not one-on-one, -on -one, you're very likely to have um, white people working on art materials with people mm. of a range of um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous but colonised cultural backgrounds. Can yeah. What on earth That's do you like, do? Uh, yeah, I mean, great question. First of all, don't panic. <laughs> don't panic. Take a breath in. I think it's just about noticing, okay, how can this space be inclusive to all people, right? And so when it comes to accessibility, when it comes to certain material choices, when it comes to um, symbols that are in the space, when it comes to how language is used, is it heteronormative? Is it ableist? Is it what, what are you considering, right? The reason why that's so important is because as we're learning, we're growing, we're evolving, and we're holding each other more tenderly in that process. And it takes time. And so you might make mistakes. I mean, it's a very human thing. The most important thing is to say, hey, I'm still learning in this area, but it matters to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kathana, thank you for the most amazing uh, lecture and talk. Uh, I've learned so much. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Mark. And can I just ask um, for my education, how we might use this, this these techniques and therapies in in pregnancy and childbirth particularly we you know there's a very we we, we deal with very diverse cultures and, and people with coming with you know often traumas and things and 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 first peoples uh who have issues that, are, that we don't even understand and yeah is this a technique that could be used during the journey of pregnancy before childbirth yeah, thank you for that question, Mark. I think what's the most important thing that I'm hearing here is that you care to support that space for that person. And it's really about what that person is comfortable with. And so checking in with them, I couldn't possibly give a universal technique, right, for every lived experience and every identity location. But what I can say is if the intention is to create a safe as possible environment, it's just about checking in instead of normalizing a practice of, hey, we usually do it this way. It's, hey, you know, what are you most comfortable with? What is something that is really culturally relevant for you? Is that something you would like to integrate into this process? Mm. Well, perhaps I'll read the, it, 
Um, she says, thank you so much for a warm, fuzzy evening that I will take forward to my long weekend and practice that and practice that reflexivity in my research and health practice. Oh, oh, thank you, Jeremy. That's I, I'm so grateful that you felt warm and fuzzy um, because I know sometimes it can feel a little activating or it can lots of things will come up. But I I feel warm hearing that. So thank you so much for sharing that. And Sarah would like to know if there's a way that she could continue to hear about your work um, and whether yeah. you can sharing your email. Um, absolutely. Yes, I can share my email in the chat. If Yes, I can just put it here, looking in colours. Am I right that your website's down at the moment? Because I was trying <laughs> it's down to at the moment. Okay, it's I was hoping I could put the website in the chat. I so know. People just have that, but uh, I can say that uh, the video from this session will go up next week, and once it's on our YouTube channel, uh, Kathana, if you'd like to, like, any time your um, your site is active again, send me yes. the link, and I can put it under the YouTube video. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Apologies, everyone. Um, it's this domain hijacking that's happening right now at the moment. Sadly, I know I see some nods of resonance there, but hopefully I can have that sorted um, within a few days. I, I can just update it on, on the YouTube. Great. When it's available. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, is there any other questions that anyone has? I know we're wrapping up, but. We might have to leave it there. We're going to leave it there. Yeah. Okay. Thank yes. you so much. Can we thank you once again for sharing your work with us and giving us so much to reflect on and be mindful of? And and can we wish you really well in um, continuing your work, Katana? Thank you so much, Robin and everyone, Anna, Michael, Mark, Sarah, for your questions and Jeremy for your beautiful comment. I so appreciate all of you and take gentle care.